John Gilbert in South Texas, where the State Department of Health goes airborne in the fight against the rabies epidemic. Hey, you all. Where I come from, it's 35 below. Y'all's banks stick to it. What's up? Flying in Ontario and, and flying down here in Texas, terrain-wise? I don't expect so. <laughs> what about the bait dispenser? How does that work? In well, if you turn around, I'll show you. 850,000 of these baits made out of dog food will be dropped over the next two-week period. Inside each of the baits is a packet of rabies vaccine. This variant historically is the variant of the rabies virus that is most often associated with human deaths. It had been essentially eliminated from the United States beginning back in the early 1950s when animal vaccines became available, domestic animal vaccines. It has now re-entered and the only place it currently exists in the United States is in South Texas. It's coming out of South Texas at, at about 45 to 50 miles per year. And if we don't contain it in South Texas with this project, then there's good indications that it will move out of South Texas to the rest of the state, and there are no geographical barriers to prevent it from moving into adjacent states and throughout the United States. So there is a potential, and I don't want to appear overdramatic, but there is a potential for this thing to become a national rabies epizootic. It takes a long time. you got to realize that what you're seeing here with, with two aircraft and, and 14 people from Ontario is the tail end of 25 years of development. Uh, this is different from just about what anyone else in the world is doing, although there are oral baiting strategies going on and programs going on in, in Europe. They're dealing with European landscapes, which are much smaller. You have a lot of urbanization things. Ontario and Texas are big country. They have a lot of open space and the airplanes are ideal for that. The great part about Twin Otters, you can put it up and you can fly it around for two and a half to three hours without having to come back to land or refill, bay, refill the, uh, the baits or, or uh, put more people on. So we can, we can bait big parts of the country on each flight. Uh, I just do want to emphasize to you that throughout these next two or three weeks, the mission is going to come first. And our mission is to drop rabies vaccine and baits uh, in a precise area over a large area of South Texas. Uh, as an experimental measure intending to control the expansion of coyote rabies to the north. And uh, I have the full support of the, the Commissioner of Health that nothing interferes with the mission. And I think it's imperative that everyone understand that we've, we're pushing with a very uh, definite time constraint in getting this thing to the field. Our initial goal was to go to the field uh, the first part of January up into the mid part of January. That was not possible for a variety of reasons. That window of opportunity is being closed by really two things. One is uh, the coyote bait acceptance is very influenced by, and I am beginning to think much more so than we originally thought, by hunger. Uh, this time of year in South Texas, the brief winter is coming to a close. Uh, based on what we saw in Logan, Utah, uh, bait acceptance is dramatically impacted by a hungry coyote. So we have to get to the field right now. Our winter has been almost non-existent and the weather is going to get warmer again. That brings the second point up that's pushing us. When weather gets warm, fire ants are going to come out. Our number one competitor species is not raccoons or feral hogs, it's the fire ant. We've got about 48 hours for a bait that lands close to a fire ant, fire ant mound to survive on the outside. So we have to get this thing in the field when the weather's cool and those mounds are dormant. So the mission for its success depends upon us pushing this thing to get out there as quickly as we can. We intend to fly the planes 8 to 10 hours a day in the air baiting and we have an average turnaround time in Ontario of about 15 to 20 minutes by the time the plane hits the ground is refueled, reloaded, and the garbage and the people are taken off and the next crew is put on. The uh, lines that we're going to fly, if they were laid end to end, would circle the world 
one and a quarter times. So this is a big operation, and uh, we're happy that y'all are all going to be a part of it. And right in the back, through the brown door, there's uh, uh, survival kits back in there. With... Whoever's riding up front with me sees the flock. Uh, whatever, don't hesitate to tell me that you know something's up there. The flights are at 500 feet. From 500 to 1,000 feet, depending on, on what uh, the ground, what we have on the ground, towns. If it's a fairly large town, I'll probably climb to 1,000 feet. When you're flying, you turn the machine on or off to avoid houses. That's the, that's actually the second choice. What you really want to do is you want to keep that baiting machine on as long as possible. So what you do is ask the pilot to move the airplane. So the GPS is only a guide. There's a little. We'll get the pilots to, to explain everything to you, but there's a little thing that shows you on the line or how far you are off the, off the, uh, the line they have. Don't worry about it. The GPS is a guide to put the airplane into the relatively right position to drop the baits. If there's farmhouses down the line, tell the pilot to move the plane over a little bit. The baits are loaded standing on end, so they come down the conveyor. So you've got a whole mess of stuff to help you with. Don't get confused by all of it. The main point of being a navigator is... Don't hit something. Don't hit something. Good. <laughs> We go. This flight will be going out with approximately 2,500 pounds of fuel and 20 tubs of bait. Uh, total gross weight is going to be somewhere around 12,500 pounds. And uh, about a three and a half hour flight in total time. Should be just great. One otter for our type of operation is certainly the most specialized type of machine we could get with its short takeoff and landing capabilities, the uh, availability of large cargo doors, the camera hatch, which has uh, been a real mainstay with regards to fish planting, and then again this rabies program we've been doing for the last six or seven years now. Uh, generally a good all-round airplane. It's uh, safe, reliable but with the short field capabilities, we're able to operate off of just any airport we can find that's uh, away from the main stream of, of heavy ATC traffic. And uh, it just fits the need all around. So if we've got a little 2,000 foot some, uh, strip somewhere that um, uh, we could operate that would be more in the middle of the baiting uh, area, then that's the one we want. It saves the client money and it makes the job go a little faster all around. This rabies control, go ahead, over. Then we just turned at uh, 900, uh, 901, and we're westbound to 902. So we'll be coming up to the Rio Grande shortly and uh, flying right up the uh, up river about uh, 10 miles and then back down to our uh, original starting point and then back inland again. Okay, so that's, that's Mexico. Doesn't look too much different than Texas. The Rio is a squiggly line here. We didn't make the flights go right up to the Rio because we didn't want them turning around in Mexican airspace, so we just designed two lines in a flight that would just go along the, uh, the edge of the river. This is the, sh the Gulf Coast over here. These mm -hmm. lines are right on the barrier islands. Mm -hmm. And that's the shore just coming in there now. So you can see where I've put the lines where there's actually, according to the map, defined land. And then these areas here are sort of sand or deposits. And so we're going to let the pilot go up and down here and then make a decision. The pilot and the navigator can decide well, do we have to do some of this? Is this really there? Is it significant? Is it just luck? And uh, so they can change things as they go. We have a tower online uh, just straight ahead of us there. We'll be turning uh, slightly to avoid that and uh, be back online again. I'm just going to shut your machine off there for a second. Uh, a little tractor down ahead of us there that's uh, in the bush. And uh, we're by it now and the uh, machine's back on. You're, you have control of it.
we came face to face with two jet trainers out of uh, one of the Air Force bases. They came right alongside. And, uh, it was a little tense for a while. We thought maybe we were going to have to follow them home to their home base. Or we were being intercepted or something, but it was really, uh, really interesting. They got on the radio, talked to us, uh, were real nice, wanted to know if we were the people that were dropping all the dog baits around, and uh, we said yes, and they said thank you, and hit the afterburners, and went straight up. Uh, Pleasanton Airport uh, is we've selected because of its availability of jet fuel. It's quiet, it's outside the major control zone, and offers us very short turnaround times and is basically right in the center of the area we're doing so that we can stretch out either way depending upon weather factors. One area that was a little concerned but uh, was the area down on the Mexican border with the uh, drug problem going on. They have some tethered balloons that uh, actually go as high as uh, 15,000 feet. If you can imagine a tethered balloon going to 15,000 feet. Kind of awesome. So we're really in a band. Uh, I'd sure feel a lot more comfortable if we had uh, those balloons down while we're, we're in the area and uh, maybe have a frequency we can talk to them and make sure that we're not uh, infringing in their operation there. And what we do, we have two okay. planes that are here from Canada. And do we have two airplanes here from Canada? What we need to do is fly by that blimp and to drop some of those baits out and we need to get permission from y'all to do that. Thank you. Okay. We, if we just had a time with you, which time we could get uh, permission with the balloon, leaving it on the ground, so that we could drop by and, and drop those baits off. Sir, what altitude can you drop those in? 500 feet. 500. 500 feet, sir. Yes, sir. What day? Do you have any idea what day would be? We'll, we'll schedule it for Monday. I think the attitudes as a whole for producers or for landowners is, is changing as a whole. There probably was a time whenever a lot of producers might have felt they didn't want any wildlife on their place. But as time has gone on, we see how producers now many times what they want to do is they want to have wildlife because that's an, a, a natural resource that they can use or utilize in, in, in conjunction with their uh, operations such as raising cows or whether it's sheep or goats. But uh, I don't know of anybody with big animals, I mean, cattle, that is really, you know, um, hard against the coyote. I think they're, I think they're just a part of the eco uh, ecology, and we, like I say, we haven't had any problems with them. Uh, they help us clean up, keep things clean around, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, coyote fits in with us good because uh, there are always some animals that uh, are dead for some reason or another, uh, baby calves and what have you, and uh, the coyotes, clean it up for us along with the buzzards carry on they they complete the ecological balance here so we uh we like the idea of having coyotes around one man was hunting and sitting in a deer blind a little half grown two far grown coyote came walking by and he just reached out picked it up set it on his lap and uh, didn't think anything about it but uh, petted it for a while and the coyote all of a sudden just went ballistic and bit him and you know, not serious, but on the hands. He threw it out of thing, ran off, didn't shoot it. Got home and his wife said, you know, what are you thinking about? <laughs> You're thinking, he, didn't, he did not consider it. And it has to, you have to consider it. Somebody kind of scary. We're not used to that. We're not used to cows. Uh, you don't see them. You, you hear them, but you, most people don't see them. Uh, it really is a, a shock when they come up to, and try and attack you. read the case history on the human cases, 
uh, the progression of development of symptoms and what happens to people and happens to their families with rabies. I feel we have a tremendous obligation for public health reasons to get this product to the field and attempt to control this rabies epidemic. Mm -hmm. uh, the science and the, the fun of flying is great, but the primary objective is to get this thing in the field for public health reasons, and I think we're all committed to that. This, the crew, you know, when you you hear you're going to work with somebody, you always wonder what they're going to be like, and it couldn't be any better. This The Canadian crew is, is super. I, I tell you, the people from Texas are, are great. I even came back with calling people sir. They just call you sir out of principle. It's just, they're beautiful people. Texans are very friendly, outspoken uh, people, and I'd go back there anytime. They uh, didn't want us to leave. There was no doubt about that with the, with the friendships that were built. It was sad to see the job over. Great people, warm, great people. How does it feel to be an honorary Texan? Well, that was quite a, that was quite a show. The presentation that was made to us at the, uh, the Texas legislature, when we were made honorary Texans, I was uh, deeply moved and appreciative of, of the honor. Goose pimples, a little shaky and excited and emotional, quite emotional about the, the whole thing. Speaker members, I'd like to suspend on that rules, take up HR number 272, which is the resolution uh, commending the uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources for their efforts in providing us a very valuable service uh, regarding vaccine uh, uh, program that they did for us to ensure that we uh, held down the rabies epidemic that has been occurring across the state. We have these honorary Texans here with us today from Canada who did a tremendous job for the state of Texas. Please join me in adoption of this resolution and also to give an extended welcome to these fellow Texans, honorary Texans for here today from Ontario. Today. Would you please stand? We stood up in the gallery and were applauded by all the Texans that were down on the floor and there was a lot of pride in the room. They appreciated the work we did, and it felt real good. It is quite an honor to to have the uh, uh, to be bestowed uh, an honorary Texan. Uh, we we didn't expect this. It was quite an end to a, a very exciting program.